security, and then popularization of consumption opportunity. That's a schematic interpretation of the project, which I think is in some respects a conventional interpretation uh, given by many of the, of the historians of the New Deal. And I'm not suggesting that the American progressives in the late 20th century could or should have repeated the content of the New Deal program. They had to do something else. They had to go to the next step. They had to invent, in their own historical circumstance, a new form of the progressive project. And that is what, on this argument, they failed to do. Yes? Uh, you're contrasting the, the completely new with the acceptance of the existing situation. But I would think that that's a, an alternative that a progressive couldn't accept. You would say there was a crisis, a financial and economic crisis in the United States. Before this crisis, inequality had already increased vastly in the United States in the closing decades of the 20th century. And with the increase in inequality came a diminishment of social engagement and of political engagement. Um, then comes the crisis. The crisis is followed by an uncertain recovery that appears only to increase the pre-existing inequality and has the characteristic of a so-called jobless recovery with uh, what by historical standards is very large unemployment. It appears to be the case that the progressives don't know what to do about this. They didn't have a project before. They didn't have a distinctive response to the financial crisis, their only response was vulgar Keynesianism. Re-regulate finance, produce fiscal stimulus, and bail out the failed financial institutions. That was their response. They didn't understand the crisis as an opportunity, as a breathing space to design a project of socially inclusive economic growth. And they don't have such a project. Now, someone might say, there is no such project. There can't be such a project. That's the beginning of an argument. Europe. I want to suggest very briefly, in a similarly schematic way, an account of the, of the European manifestation of this predicament. The most popular model of social and economic organization in the United States is not the American model. The most popular model is a, a mystified view of European social democracy. So if the world could vote, the world would not vote to become the United States. The world would vote to become Sweden. <laughs> but not the real Sweden. Just an imaginary Sweden. So European social democracy is the most uh, influential and authoritative program in the world. So let's try to understand what's happened to European social democracy as another take on this predicament. 
The background is the social democratic settlement of the mid-20th century, of which, in a sense, Roosevelt's New Deal was an American counterpart. The settlement began to be designed before the Second World War, but it was only consolidated in the aftermath of the Second World War. A very simple understanding of the content of the social democratic compromise would be this. The forces that challenged the established organization of power and production in the rich North Atlantic economies abandoned this challenge. And in exchange for their abandonment of this challenge, the government was allowed to acquire significant powers in the sphere of regulation and of compensatory redistribution. That was the essence of the social democratic compromise. Uh, and this form of political economy had the following major components, viewed in an entirely unsentimental and unapologetic way. The first component were a series of arrangements and rules that protected large parts of the society against economic insecurity and competition. Protected small business against big business. Protected workers in the capital intensive sectors of the economy against competition in the labor market and protected firms against competition in the market for corporate control. The second component of this social democratic political economy was an institutional machinery for the creation of social contracts, agreements between organized labor and big business brokered by national governments to define a course of governmental policy that influenced the distribution of advantage in society. And the third component of the social democratic political economy was a high level of redistributive social entitlements supported by a high tax take, which paradoxically relied on the regressive taxation of consumption, as now through the value-added tax. Now, the basic history, the basic institutional history of European social democracy in the late 20th century can be told in the following way. That the first two elements have been largely abandoned in cumulative steps. And European social democracy has retreated to the last line of defense which is the maintenance of a high level of redistributive social entitlements financed by the regressive taxation of consumption. The ideological horizon, the programmatic world in which this project makes sense and exercises authority, is the idea that the ultimate objective is to reconcile American-style economic flexibility with European-style social protection. And the 
innovation that most characteristically captures this ambition is the so-called flex security system adopted in general in the Scandinavian social democracies and in the Netherlands. Workers cease to have job tenure but are given a series of portable economic and social protections. A very narrow focus. What is left out? Three large issues that seem decisive for the future of social democracy. First, there's the issue of access to the advanced sectors of production where wealth is increasingly created, the capital-intensive, knowledge-intensive sectors of production. Who is to have access to them? Even in the most egalitarian European social democracies, the majority is excluded from them. The second large issue is the issue of cohesion and solidarity. Compensatory redistribution through tax and transfer seems to be too thin a social cement. Transfers of money among people who have no engagement or connection with one another. And the third large issue is the issue of change and crisis. The basic rhythm of European life since the 20th century remains unchanged. In war, the Europeans wake up. In peace, they fall asleep and drown their sorrows in consumption. This is simply a variant of the fundamental, the world problem of change and crisis. The three problems that I mentioned, the problem of access to the advanced sectors, the problem of the insufficiency of money transfers as a social cement, and the problem of making change possible without crisis all seem to require a reopening of the social democratic bargain of the mid-20th century. They all seem to require experimentation with the institutional forms of power and of production, precisely what was abandoned at the inception of the social democratic settlement. So that's, a, as it were, a, a European take on the same predicament. Would someone like to comment on that, on that European discussion? Yes. So. So there's, let, let me begin with a, a polemical factual remark. The remark is this. Everyone who believes in alternatives from the right or from the left tends to be against the European Union. The young, the restless, uh, the, the visionaries, the discontents of all types are against the European Union. This is and the, the harmonizing technocrats are in favor of the European Union. The people who believe the history is over, that uh, we need to humanize the inevitable, that globalization makes everything impossible, and so on and so forth. This is fatal to the European Union. This is a poison. But it doesn't have to be this way, a progressive might say. So this uh, is 
translated into a